First, I want to say thank you to uh, Kevin as he preached this morning. I was sharing with him just a little while ago that um, this morning as I was reading in the Bible, as some of us young men are reading kind of through scriptures together, we were actually in that same passage, Luke chapter 17. Um, and, or maybe I was a day behind and so I was in Luke chapter 17. Either way, that's what I was in this morning. And um, I just had entered my own thoughts from that passage but also God was really dealing with me in that passage of how much I, when I look into um, my life and consider the things going on in my life, I lack that response of gratefulness and that response of praise and worship of God. Um, and I have so much to praise God for, to thank God for, and to worship him for. Um, and so in considering that, I was just reminded this morning twice uh, to give God glory, to give him praise. So thank you, um, Kevin very much uh, for your message this morning. Um, I am determining a couple of things. One of the things that I'm determining is that I am going to do my best to speak up. I have gotten much counsel that when I preach, I am often very quiet. Um, and Danny is probably helping me out a good bit, so I appreciate that. Um, but if I ever need to turn things up, just you know, do this, and I'll get the signal, and I will learn to speak up. With that being said, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for um, all the things that you do. Lord, we thank you, God, that you are especially gracious and kind to us. We thank you that, Lord, you are looking for a day in which, yes, we will all get to heaven. Um, and, Lord, that is a day of rejoicing. Lord, there is rejoicing even going on, Lord, now as people are one to you and are taught to follow you. Lord, that that is great rejoicing that the angels participate in. God, I pray that right now as we look into your word that you would speak to us, um, Lord, where we are. Um, we're in different areas of life. We're in different circumstances around this room, but we are all in your body. We're all in your spirit. God, I pray that you would draw us into your spirit, that you would let us hear you. Lord, help me to hear you. Um, Lord, I know that there have been things, Lord, just in, in my life recently, just that has been distracting me, Lord, from what you are saying. Um, and the, the task of focusing upon you, our God, um, can be at times a difficult task that requires a resolve. God, I pray that you would speak to us and that we would hear. Lord, that Satan would not steal from us the things that you are saying to us. Lord, even simple things in your word as we look into it today. Um, God, I pray that especially you would um, move me aside and that you would do your work by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I had my own bout of sickness, um, and I'm still in some sense recovering. You may hear some congestion going on. Um, it's amazing, I guess. I, I marvel at how God has made our bodies that just little things can upset um, everything, I guess. You know, you, when you feel the congestion and it's just like, okay, it just feels like there's just a lot of something wrong in my head right now, and I just want to reach inside behind the skin and just yank all of whatever this is out. Um, that's probably a really sick illustration. Um, hopefully that's the sickest illustration that I will use um, in, our, in our sermon time today. Um, with that being said, I was, as I was sitting down this afternoon, I, I was like, I need rest, and I also need to finish preparing. Um, this is a message that God, God has put on my heart for the past couple of weeks. I was asked um, by some of our high schoolers to give a, 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 a message as they had a late night event, and that was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I gave that, this message basically then, and one of the things also that came up was I was also asked to speak to our sixth graders, and I changed the message for them. Um, and I guess in, in giving the message twice already, I realized that depending on your audience, there's different things to focus on, there's different depths to explore, different aspects of the passage to really bring out, and maybe with sixth graders, I can't explore into the deep scriptures of, uh, say, Hebrews and, and, and deep theology as we can, uh, maybe more so in this room. Um, so the message has been delivered twice, but in different ways. And so I was thinking this afternoon, I need to really give that time to also continue to, to fine tune it. Um, but I was also tired. So there was this going on and, and then taking notes. Um, and so I, I, I'm excited for the things that God is sharing with us. I think it's fairly a simple focus. The title of my message really is My Brother's Keeper my brother's keeper, and I'm not coming from the passage that you would probably assume, because uh, when I say that, what book would you assume that I would be coming from? Genesis. We're not going to be in Genesis today. 
Um, I think one of our stories will come from Genesis, but we're going to really be in the passage that Kevin has already read for us. Um, as we dive into Joshua, uh, he read from chap- Joshua chapter one. And um, we know the story. I'll remind us a bit of the story um, as we look into it. But Joshua chapter one, Joshua's just getting his job or getting his promotion, his job change as Moses has passed on and Moses has finished his work. Um, And so now Joshua has to pick up where Moses left off. And Moses left off at the big part of the task. The people have to get into the promised land. That was really the main thing. Um, God had promised Abraham before uh, that he, his people, his descendants would enter into that promised land. Um, but Moses didn't get them there. He got them right to the edge, right? Um, and Moses, even in his faithfulness, right? We know why he doesn't get them there. But now this falls to Joshua. And, jo- and God speaks to Joshua and says, be strong, be courageous, do this task. And Joshua first really goes to these tribes, these three tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh half-tribe of Manasseh, if you will. Um, And so in his going to them, he reminds them of a job that they have, a responsibility that they have. And when he reminds them of that, he's reaching back to something that they had already promised to Moses. So from Joshua chapter one, now I'm gonna actually step back to Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. I may not read all of it, but I have 32 verses I do kind of wanna look at. We may skip around a little bit. We probably will. Um, but in the story, in the backstory, he reminds him of something of Moses' command. So Joshua, Joshua's reminder comes from Moses' command, and that's really where I want to begin. My first point is Moses' command. In verse 1, and actually I should, I want to use this Bible here in front of me. Numbers chapter 32, verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. So what did they have? Cattle, all right, so they got cows, they got whatever, things that graze in the field. They need um, a field, if you will. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place for what? Cattle. So they put two and two together. We have a multitude of cattle, and here is a place for cattle. But this place that is for cattle is not the promised land. This place that is for cattle is on the other side of Jordan. Not where God said, I'm going to take your people and I'm going to move them to Abraham. But this is really on the other side. They had encountered this territory partially because um, they had won the territory when they had asked to be, um, to travel through, right? They had received opposition and they had won some of this territory. And now it's available. It's wide open. It's a field that's wide open in front of them. So two and two together, we have cattle. This is a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eliezer, the priest, and unto the princes of the congregation saying, and I'm not gonna read all those names, so we can go ahead and skip right down to verse four. Um, Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel. God delivered this land before us. Hey, we're talking about that land that we've just opened up. Hey, they say, it is a land for cattle. And thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in your sight, in thy sight, let this land be given unto us, sorry, be given unto thy servants for a possession and bring us not over Jordan. Now, I'm not going to pause too long over that last phrase, but that last phrase stuck out to Moses, right? They're saying, we see what we need right here. And I'm I'm wondering, I need to establish my territory here. So if I'm going to get that established right, I think... That from your perspective, here would be the land before the Jordan. And then you have the Jordan, and then you walk over into the promised land. I believe that that's right. So they're looking at it, and they're saying, before we cross the Jordan, if this is going to illustrate my line for the Jordan, if you will, we see something here. What God promised us is over here. But what we see is something that's useful right here. We have cattle. This is a land good for cattle hey, we'd like to use this now because it's going to be a little while before we get into that promised land. Um, And then they add that last bit, don't take us over into the promised land. Moses has to respond to that. He has to respond to that because if he doesn't respond to that, he's just allowing a 
a situation that's probably been an ongoing situation. He says, hey, and Moses does, does respond. Um, Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brethren go to war? And shall ye sit here? He's responding uh, with a question that's also a rebuke, right? Um, is it right that you take this open land that's for good for cattle, and then while you chill over here, you know your brothers are going to have to fight for a land that's promised to them over here. Is it right that they just have to fight while you chill? That's really what he's asking them. Um, and then he, he continues to dig in here. And he says, wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers. And He's really waxing eloquent here in this, in, this, in this rebuke. Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. And he reminds them of the story of the 12 spies, right? And those 12 spies came back and only two of them gave a truly good report. And the other 10 were like, freak out everybody, get scared because we can't take it over. We're not about to go into the promised land. We're not about to. And everybody was afraid and scared and they never crossed over at that point. And what they've just said, those three tribes is, don't bring us over the Jordan either. So that's why Moses has to respond. The people of God must enter into the rest that God has promised them. So Moses' command has to do specifically with that issue of the promised land and the rest that the people are promised. So they think about it, right? They look at that situation um, after Moses res reminds them of everything that had happened before and how the people had been discouraged from entering into the promised land. They think about the situation. And they go, okay, so Moses is bringing up the issue that we're going to prevent God's people from going into the promised land. We're going to discourage them from going in. That's the, the issue that he wants us to deal with. But our issue is we have cattle now. We, have, we see land that's good for cattle. Can we use that? Can we find a compromise? So they find one. Um, verse 16. It says, and they came near unto him, unto Moses, and said, we will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will go ready, armed, before the children of Israel until we have brought them into their place. And our little ones shall dwell in the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the yonder, yonder side Jordan or forward because our inheritance is fallen to us on this side Jordan eastward. So that's their compromise. They say, okay, we'll, we'll get the land over here, but we'll make sure we're not gonna discourage them. As a matter of fact, we're gonna go on before them and fight these battles and make sure that we don't go back to that rest that we've got. We don't chill until our friends, our brothers have the promise. That's their compromise. And Moses says, hey, okay, I can take that. If you will do this thing, if you will go armed before the Lord to war and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he hath driven out his enemies from before him and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward you shall return and be, what's that word? guiltless before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. And then that memorable verse that was quoted to me often as a young man, as a child, but if you will not do so, do so behold, ye have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. I cannot tell you how many times my mother would quote that passage to me, be sure your sin will find you out. But now we see the background behind that their sin of not keeping what they had promised before the Lord and before the people of Israel would find them out. So that's Moses' command. Um, and that's what Joshua reminds them of in Joshua chapter one. Um, in thinking about this, really the situation is they are gonna get something, they're gonna get a rest here. Leave aside for now the issue of the promised land. I think that's another message to explore. But they're about to get their rest here before everybody else gets their rest here. And that's the, 
That's the struggle. And what they promise is, no, we're not going to chill here until everybody's taken care of. It's kind of like at my house um, growing up when we would sit down to dinner and some of you guys have homes where this, this would happen where mom would serve everybody. Everybody gets their portion of food. And yes, we know who gets the big portion of food. Who's that? Nobody? Dad. Dad gets the big portion of food. But he didn't get his portion until after everybody else was taken care of. So mom would make sure that we as, our, as young men got our food around the table and then she would serve dad. And I guess really the last one to get her plate would be mom. Um, that is absolutely true. The parents waited until the children had theirs. They were determined in that moment that we, they were going to chill and start and have their food before everybody else had theirs. I think that's kind of the picture. Um, this is even something that we see in our society, right? It's considered improper and unkind, right? If, if I was to be sitting in the pews, say, and pull out a, a, a packet of gum, right? And somebody sitting next to me, there's an obligation kind of that I have, a tacit obligation that if I'm going to take out a stick of gum for myself and there's somebody right over here that can kind of just start to smell the mint just coming up off the wrapper, that can, you know, start to see me just unwrap that and just, oh man, they're salivating already. I've got to not only get a piece of gum for myself, but I've got to do what? Offer it to the person next to me, which is why I never bring gum to church. Um, actually, this morning, as I was dealing with one of our loud young men, uh, I was talking with him quietly, and I was thinking, man, I'm sick, and hopefully I am not, he's not going to respond to me and say, bro, your breath stinks. But he immediately, as I was talking with him, he held out his hand. He's like, uh, can I have a mint? Had nothing to do with what I was saying to him. He's like, can I have a mint? And I was like, where is this question coming from? I was like, I don't, I don't have any mints. He's like, so that's just, that's just toothpaste that I'm smelling? And I was like, well, I don't have any mints in my pocket, so I guess, yeah, that's my toothpaste that you're smelling. But he was expecting, right, you, got, you have a mint, you're going to give one to me. You're not going to leave me without one. Um, he was disappointed because I kept my principle. No gum do I bring to church. Um, but yeah, there's this, 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 this feeling that we have in this uh, custom, right, that generally we don't just take care of ourselves without taking care of the person next to me. And that's a strong biblical principle that we see in this passage, but also all throughout scripture. I want us to consider some other examples that we see in scripture of this idea of not pursuing our own rest until we've pursued the rest of others. Um, for one example, we could turn to Ruth. Ruth chapter three. Ruth is after Judges. Um, in the story of Ruth, right, we have Naomi. She loses her husband, her two sons, they got married, and then they die, and so now she's left with two widows, and one goes back to stay in Moab, and Naomi returns with Ruth. Ruth um, promises to take care and to walk with faithfully her mother-in-law. Um, and when she gets there to back, um, Naomi's kind of despairing. She's feeling down. And Ruth goes and she's hunting for food. And we get to chapter two where Ruth comes across a certain wonderful field belonging to a certain wonderful man uh, named Boaz. And as soon as Naomi hears about this, she is happy. Very happy. Um, she's happy, one, that they've gotten food. But as you look into Ruth chapter three, verse one, Naomi, her mother-in-law, right after Ruth has been gleaning in the fields of Boaz and she's promised that she's only going to go there at Naomi's uh, council. She says unto her, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee? Shall I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? What Naomi is really saying there is, I am not about to just chill. I'm gonna pursue your rest is kind of the idea that she's doing there. And Ruth actually does the same and exhibits that same behavior toward Naomi. That wouldn't be the only situation where I would say we see this aspect of taking care of others and not just 
um, chilling because I am okay and I have all the things that I need. Nehemiah chapter one. We could turn there. Actually, I think I'm gonna be in chapter two. Yes, Nehemiah chapter two. I'm hopping around a good bit. Wonderful. Nehemiah chapter two. So Nehemiah gets news at, in chapter one about the condition of Jerusalem. And this is after Jerusalem has been destroyed, right? And the walls are sitting in a horrible condition. And without walls around your city that are strong and that are sturdy and that are upright, you are vulnerable. But Nehemiah doesn't live in Jerusalem. Nehemiah lives in a wonderful palace. Nehemiah has a wonderful job, unless somebody doesn't like the king and really has a, has a great plan. Nehemiah has a pretty good job and he eats pretty good food. He's, got, he's a pretty satisfied person. But when he hears about the condition of the walls of Jerusalem, he immediately responds um, with grief, with grief. And he mourns and he prays to God, um, repenting for the sins of his own people. And then we get to chapter two, where he stands before the king and Verse one there, it says, and it came to pass in the month Nisan in the 20th year of Art Artaxerxes the king that wine was before him and I took up the wine and I gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Never before had I been sad, but now I'm sad in front of the king. Wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. He's afraid because he's supposed to be happy. The king needs happy people around him. He needs people that are gonna feed him good vibes. Um, and he's like, this is not gonna be good for me if I don't feed the king good vibes. But he has a reason to grieve. And so he says, in honesty, um, and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. He's feeling the pain of those who don't have rest. He's identifying with them. And what he's saying is, I know I'm here in a palace and I've kind of got what I need so I can chill. Look, we got wine in this place. I got you king, I got you queen, all these wonderful people around. We're secure, but I have to be sad. Why should my countenance not be sad when I consider that the place of my fathers is destroyed? They don't have peace. How can I possibly stand before you, king, and just chill? And so then he goes on, right, and he asks the king, hey, give me what I need so I can go and I can pursue the peace of my brothers and he carries that through. This is another example of how we pursue the peace of our brothers. This is another example of how we are charged really to be our brother's keeper. Um, there are other scriptures really that we, we could even go to. I think about Joseph. Here we do get to go to Genesis. Um, Genesis chapter 45. I just love looking at these examples, if nothing else. Scripture is so full of these examples for us that show us how we then should live. Um, and these are beautiful stories. Genesis chapter 45. So Joseph, in his circumstance, right? Before this, he had been the favorite son. And then he'd been the maligned son um, as he's sold off. And he goes into Egypt. And then he's a slave, and he's a prisoner. And then finally, he goes from prison to the palace. He gets there because he has revealed the king's, Pharaoh's dream, but not only done that, he's given the Pharaoh some counsel that, that will save the lives of Egypt and that will save the lives of many people. But we haven't seen his brothers um, until the famine shows up. Right, so they get seven years of plenty and then they start to have a famine and Joseph's brothers show up. Don't, not gonna go through all of that story, but reaching into chapter 45, when we get there, we're really gonna start at verse seven. Joseph has been dealing with his brothers the whole time and waiting for the opportunity to reveal himself to them. 
And so that's where we're at in, jo in, in Genesis 45, verse 7. And now he's talking to them. And he says, God sent me before you to preserve you. God sent me before you to preserve you, a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, go up to my father and say unto him, thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast, and there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. What he's saying is I've been here, and I've had everything that I've needed, right? Um, in some sense now he's in this place, right, where he's now forgotten all of his trial. He's reached a place of rest, but he knows the purpose for which he is in this rest is that he can work to bring rest to his brothers, that he can work to bring peace to them, that he can work to bring salvation to them. That's the purpose. And he's not going to chill until, hey, my brothers come, my father comes, and I bring them into a place of peace and rest until I save them. And when we look at Joseph there and his words there, hear in those words the heart of Jesus, because that's the heart of Christ. There will I nourish thee. I'm going to nourish you. Right? What did Jesus say before he left his disciples? He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's us. Right? He says to them when he, when he passes the cup around, which we're going to do in a little while, he says, I'm not going to drink of this until I drink it with you again. I'm waiting for something. He's looking forward to that. He's eager for that, to bring us that rest. That's been his work. We hear the heart of Christ. And so the question really then comes then to us. And I guess I've forgotten all my points and I have changed up all my points, guys, I'm sorry. So if you're trying to draw those, those three points on that outline, good luck, because I've just passed over step number two and we're really gonna jump right down to number three and I don't even know, I think I'm gonna change the, the title for that and if I've already messed up number two, hey, let's just go ahead and say we're reaching toward that third point and we are gonna find a landing strip somewhere. Um, but Hebrews chapter four is where I want to turn. Because when we think about rest, and when we think about all these examples that we looked at in the Old Testament, and then we see the reflection of Christ, um, there's a different rest that we talk about. Um, our pastor uh, from before Peter, Roger, uh, one of the last gifts that he gave to me, I think on my graduation from uh, grad school, he gave me a book, he gave me two books, and this was one that he gave me, um, The Saint's Everlasting Rest, and I believe it was a favorite book of his. Um, and he wanted me to have that and to read that. And that's really what we're turning to is the passage where that, um, where that comes from. So Hebrews chapter four. Random side note, modern technology has ruined me to turning in a Bible because when I first wake up, I go right to my phone and find the Bible app and I'm just, this is, this is how I turn pages, you know, and tap, 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 boom, scroll. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to use uh, this passage here, the, this actual physical Bible here in front of me, which I do from time to time, but it's not my usual, I guess. Um, but here, look at this word rest and look at what this word rest means for us. I think we know, but look in this passage. He says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering in, into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. There's a rest, a promise of rest. And he says, we don't wanna come short of that promise. We don't wanna miss it. 
Kind of like when there were some 12 spies and 10 of them said, hey, yo, it's really scary over there. We're not going there. And they freaked out and they came short of it. Actually, exactly like that, because in Hebrews, he really reminds them of these things, that, that specific storyline with the promised land. And so he says, hey, look, they missed out on a rest. Let's not miss out on that rest ourselves. So he says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into what? Rest. Belief. Belief unto salvation, right? That is the rest that we are looking for. That is the rest that Christ has, br has brought to us. That is the rest that in some sense we enjoy now, but in this passage, like he, he draws different aspects of that rest. There's an aspect of it that we enjoy right now, that we get right now, that's even outside that promised land, if you will. But there's a fullness of that rest later on, right? As long as we're down here, we're not there yet, but we can enjoy some rest. And we enter in that rest through belief. Um, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place, actually I'm gonna skip down uh, to verse nine. Um, now, there remaineth therefore a rest unto the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. He has what he needs. I can rest. Let us labor, therefore, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And so now this starts to come home to the application, and the application really being, we have, hopefully, as we hopefully believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have believed on him for salvation, we have a pursuit we have entered somewhat into a rest. But who is my brother, right? Who is still waiting to enter into that promised land? What is my responsibility? Considering Christ, considering Nehemiah, considering Joseph, considering Naomi, considering all of these examples, considering Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, what is my responsibility? for those who have not yet entered in. We can look, um, and I'm, I'm gonna reach out toward the testimony that we would hope would be able to be said of us at the end of our lives in some sense. So Joshua chapter 22, we see an end to this um, saga of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. And we see a word for us, a something to live up to. When Joshua reminded those three tribes of their promise, of Moses' command, that they had said, hey, we're not gonna chill until we go over before our brothers, right? We're gonna build houses. We're gonna bring our children into safety. We're gonna take care of those things that we have responsibility for and those directly under us, right? We're gonna bring peace to those who are with us. But we're not going to just chill. We're going to go over before our brothers into this land and make sure that they get their rest. And then after every one of our brothers has rest, then we'll go back. That's what they promised. And in, that was in Joshua chapter one that they reaffirmed that promise. Seven years later, right? It's years that pass by that they've left their homes. They're fighting for about seven years um, between Joshua chapter one and Joshua 22. But then Joshua calls these same folks back after seven years of fighting, after seven years of going through that promised land and winning that land for their brothers, routing out the enemy so that they could then make new homes in this promise of rest that they had received. Joshua, now seven years later, speaks to them and says, he called unto him, I'm starting at verse, verse one. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days. 
unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. I think there's a part of that too that I want to, as I was thinking about that this afternoon, specifically with us, right? There's a role and a responsibility that we've been chasing down over the past 40 years, specifically here at Straight Gate, right? And a task to bring rest to those who don't enjoy that rest. And in some sense, I want to say, and I feel God saying, hey, look, you've been keeping that. And that's not an easy work. It's not an easy work. So I want to commend you for that work. Um, I often um, think to myself at home as I ponder all that goes on at Straight Gate for things to work well for the ministry that we are exercising toward um, others. We depend on teachers to show, right? and to plan a lesson, and to deliver a lesson, and to deliver not only a lesson, but to deliver love and joy and truth. We depend on drivers to show up and drive. We depend on buses being fixed, and we depend on so much. We depend on coordination. We depend on common belief, right, and faith. We depend on so much. We depend on elders to have direction and vision and to meet and give that direction for us. We depend on so much. That's a work. Seven years, those three tribes have been fighting and fighting, not for their homes, fighting and fighting for the homes of their brothers. And I want to commend us that, hey, there is this that can be said even of us, of you. So he says to them, right, you have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren. Imagine that. Wow. But imagine that in terms of my brother, your brother, those that we fight for. Now the Lord your God has given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Therefore now return ye and get you unto your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses, a servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side, Jordan. And then he gives them a command, right, to follow in the ways of of the law. That's what we want said about us. Once we have done all that God has called us to do, that we can say, or that God can say of us, you've kept it all. From day to day, you obeyed my voice. And now God has given rest to your brothers. And now that they have rest, now it's time for you to rest. It's not really an altar call. I just want to, Um, really close with that. Um, And as I bring it to a close, I'm just going to pause really for uh, some silence and give you a chance just to think about those that you are laboring for, those that you are laboring to bring rest to, and ask God for that faithfulness to walk out continually to labor for their rest because it is a worthy mission and it is also a charge that we have before the Lord our God. So I want to pause and let us silently ponder that and pray on that. And then I'm going to close uh, this time in prayer and we can then uh, prepare for um, our communion. Father, we thank you for the mission that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a great mission, a great commission to go and to make disciples of 
all nations. God, we are surrounded by brothers who need rest. And Lord, we want to labor for their rest so that they don't fall short of the promise of your rest with you. God, I pray that you would continue, Lord, to ignite in us that passion. Lord, I pray that you would continue, Lord, to renew our strength. I pray that you would continue to give us wisdom. I pray that you would continue, Lord, to walk with us to complete the work that you have begun. And Lord, we also know that you will do so and that you are doing so. So continue to lead us and may we continue to walk hand in hand with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now going to turn to our uh, communion. And I told Ben, I said, I am going to stumble through this and this will be a wonderful thing. First Corinthians, is it first Corinthians or second Corinthians? Um, 